So in the last slide you saw a bunch of theories and Chris was telling you they're all nonsense. So uh, why, yeah, some of them are. But, so if they're nonsense, why are they, why, why do we have all those names still up there on the, on the board? Why, why do we still discuss those theories? Well, the reason is, and the reason that, and you, you know some of this because you've been doing experiments during, during our practical sessions, is that we're not 100% sure. And that's the whole point of the scientific method. So, you know, I had the, I had the previous slide and, and the formal title, but really what my talk is all about is what we're actually trying to do in cosmology. We have theories and we have data, and we need some way to link the two. Now, you've done experiments, you've seen how difficult it is even in the simplest of cases, simplest of measurements to get things accurate enough and how impossible it is to get them 100% accurate. So, how do we go from these pretty pictures to the theories? What comes first, data or theory? Well, this is, uh, it's a chicken and egg situation. The data is there and then, and then you construct the theory, but sometimes you have the theory and then you design your experiment, you measure your data, and then you go back to the theory and adjust. So, you've seen that we can never have 100% measurement precision. And we can never be 100% sure of our theory. So this little chicken is asking, does that mean I can never be sure of anything? Can I, can I even do cosmology? Can I make sense of the universe? <laughs> well, it turns out <laughs> that the, yeah, the, front, the front row... <laughs> Actually, we all owe our jobs to the fact that we can never be 100% sure. Because think about it, if we did, if, if Galileo was 100% right, then that's the, that's the end of cosmology, that's the end of physics. He's right, okay, that's fine. But we're still in business, we're still trying to adjust these theories, going back and forth between theory and data. And it turns out that our tool is probability. Because we have incomplete information. And we're trying to make sense of this information to construct some universal theory. And um, the truth, uh, Liz was talking about facts and truth. Um, here I use truth in the, um, in the scientific sense, as in what is reality, what, what is the true theory. We can never be 100% certain. We can never say this is it. But we have some probability, we have some degree of belief. So when you are taking your measurements, the distance between our fake galaxy, which uh, I think we've lost, we've, we've given the equipment back, that distance did not change. But each time you, some of you carried out the experiment more than once, and you found a slight difference. Was the real distance changing? No. Well, you know that, the, it's the same floor, same distance. But what was happening was you had some errors in your measurement, and that was changing the final result. So you, you do not have 100% certainty, but you have some, some degree of belief that that distance is the true distance. Now, how do we go from this data that we collect to this theory saying, okay, we've, we've measured this distance, so we have this theory saying, for instance, that the, the, um, the Hubble constant is, in fact, a constant. And it turns out that we have to go back 200 years or 250 years to, um, to someone called Thomas Bayes. He was a clergyman, that's why we have, we have no pictures of this uh, very important man in, in physics, because we use his tools, um, but that's what he would have looked like, more or less. And um, 
Oh, that's, uh, that's Joshua Reynolds' portrait of some Presbyterian clergyman, if you... <laughs> I, 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 I found the right century, uh, right, right profession, so, so that's it. Well, he, he looks... Who? Yeah, he was, yeah. Well, why? That, does that convince you more? <laughs> Great. Okay. So, and, and he came up with something. I'll, I will show you just one equation, so don't worry. And, and it has nothing to do with physics. So he came up with this. And other people were studying these games of chance, probability. So uh, people would be playing cards in the 18th century and um, someone would win and then they would win again and they would win the third time. And someone would say, uh, Monsieur, I think you are cheating. And the other guy would go, uh, indeed, I am not, sir. Pistols or swords? that have a duel, someone would get killed. So we need to understand these things. Probability is a very, very difficult concept to understand. There are whole conferences just so experts can, can discuss these deep issues among themselves. So Bayes realized that the probability of, of an event A, given that B has already happened, is not the same as the probability of B given that A has already happened. And they are in fact related by, by this equation, which is, in my view, just as important as GMM over R squared or E equals MC squared. And it's so important that someone has written it out in neon. I, I, I need to find this place. Um, so the, the, the little vertical line means given. So something has already happened. The probability of A when B has already happened. Now, fine, we have this equation, we have this, we have this theorem, Bayes' theorem. Um, how exactly is that related to, to what we're doing here, to cosmology and physics? How about we consider A as our data and B as our theory? And then we can find a link between the two. And this is what we do here. Um, I've just changed the names of those events of A and B. And we call this whole process that we carry out Bayesian inference because it is based on, on Bayes. And it's all about making sensible decisions based on incomplete information. And really, since we're scientists, we need a mathematical definition of what sensible means. We, we need to know when, when the probability is right enough, uh, how we get from one thing to another, and how, how to do it in a mathematical way, a way that makes sense. Uh, and we, we are now in the, in, at the point in, in the history of cosmology where we have mountains of data. We need to make sense of it all. And we're using these tools all the time. So, you can see the, the different tidbits of facts that we know. So, sometimes I know the data. So, I want to know how probable my theory is after I have measured the data. And that's called the posterior because it comes after I carry out my experiment. Sometimes I want to, to predict my future data. Uh, Chris was, was telling us about the, the usefulness of the scientific method being exactly this, is that you have a theory that can tell you what your future data will look like. In that case, um, I want to know the, the probability of my data given the model, so that's, that's the likelihood. I also have some information about the model itself, about the theory itself, before I even collect data. So if I have a theory, um, say, about the relationship between orbital velocities and, and, and the, 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 uh, the orbital radius, I already know that, that the m in my equation cannot be negative because we, negative mass does not exist. So that's the information I have before I do anything. That's what we call the prior. And then I have the the probability that the measured data is what I actually measure. So what I actually measure is the true value. And that's called the, uh, 
That's called the evidence. The model itself contains parameters. So what we need to know is how do we choose the parameters in our theory? So let's say we have collected a bunch of data, we have, we have our points there, and this is what we do, uh, you know, I, I, I remember from, from secondary school we, we used to draw graphs by hand, and it was rather boring because it was all about proving a theory that was written down in the textbook. Uh, in cosmology it's slightly more exciting because we don't know what the right theory is. Uh, so, so we have those points, so which one of those lines is best? So we have different choices. We can choose some, some linear relation, some, some, we can draw a straight line through the points. And in that case, you, you all know what the equation of, of that line would look like. We have an intercept and we, we have a gradient, so A plus BX. So we have two, three parameters. So the Y and X are the data. The parameters in our theory are A and B. But um, those points don't look like they lie on a straight line, so uh, how about we, we plot a quadratic curve? And in that case, we have three free parameters. But hang on a minute, we could just join the, the points with straight lines, short straight lines. And in that case, we have a lot more free parameters. So you might be asking, why not choose the model which fits the data exactly. But that's not what we really want. We want something that's predictive, and Chris explained this. The question we're asking is not what is the exact fit to the data, but how well we can predict future data. So if I were to draw a straight line through all the points, where will my next point lie? The last, the last curve over the, the, this one doesn't tell me anything about where the next dot will lie. And what I really want is something that gives me a clue. I don't require 100% certainty. I require some degree of certainty, some, some sensible probability. So if I draw a straight line, I know that my next point should lie close to that straight line, somewhere, somewhere in that region, within, within some region of confidence. And this is, you, you, now we come to, to the philosophical part. Now we can go back to the guys at the philosophy department and get, get their advice. And this is what is known as Occam's razor. You, you might have heard this term. And uh, you know, today we would just say, keep it simple, stupid. Um, and this is what we do in, in physics. We choose the model with the, with the least parameters, the, the simplest model that fits the data sensibly. It doesn't need to fit the data exactly. It never will. It never will. We, we carry out experiments. Experiments have some measurement errors. We will never have a theory that fits the data exactly. That's why the, uh, the, the last slide on the, on the previous talk was full of different alternative theories because they, they all fit the data to some degree. But the point is, and the, the, the best guideline in cosmology and in, in physics and in science in general is to find that the, the simplest theory that fits the facts. So, so there's Occam, um, and he's giving us a clue about how to choose between alternative theories. Um, so he, he's telling us that when, when we have two possible explanations, we just choose the, the one that is most likely to be true. Now, he doesn't say the one that is absolutely true. It's most likely to be true. And that is what I mean by degree of belief. You know, is general relativity the true theory? It is with a very high probability. And that's all we can say. That's the scientific method. If we say it's 100% sure, that's not science, that's dogma because then we wouldn't be able to go back and test it. If we, we've already said it's 100% true. So the next question to ask, once we've chosen our model, is uh, what are the values of the parameters? And, um, and it turns out that 
all the data we have in astrophysics and cosmology can be sensibly explained by a model with only six parameters. And um, I wanted to mention this because this brings everything you've learned about together. So, so this is all we need. This is the, the entire theory of cosmology. So we, we have these six parameters. It's a very simple model if you think about it. Six parameters to explain the entire universe. So we have, we have the Hubble constant that, that you, you know about. Um, we have the, the content of the universe. So you know there's ordinary matter. That's what we're all made of. We have dark matter. You, uh, you've learned about that. Dark energy. Thank you, Jim. Um, then you have the, the size of the initial seeds of structure, the initial fluctuations. And then we also need to know the time when, when the first galaxies formed, because that tells us how the universe looks today. It tells us how structures develop. And we're done. We can go home. Now, I've put an asterisk there. You'll, you'll see why. So, um, so then we get this. And that's, you know, you've, you've seen this picture probably too many times during this workshop. That's why I use it again, because you're familiar. So that's, that's all we have. Six parameters gives us that. Very simple model. Now, in, in the introduction, in the first five minutes of this workshop, we, we promised to, uh, to tell you why we believe the Big Bang Theory is true. And here's why. Sorry, it's not a picture, it's a graph. Okay, this is data from, from Planck. You've seen the, uh, the videos, the pictures from Planck, but pictures are fine. Walt Whitman loves them, I'm sure, but, uh, but scientists, scientists prefer to put things on graphs. Yes, they don't look as pretty, but we can put numbers, and numbers are very useful. So those red dots are the data points. Each one of them, the... Um, just find the laser pointer. The ones over there have ve the, the, the measurement errors of these points is very, very small. So there's an error bar, but you, you almost cannot see it. The errors over there are slightly larger. And the green line is the line given by theory. Now that's an amazing fit. It's very good. But is it, is it 100? Does it fit the points? 100%. No. Obviously, you know that. You, know, you, you have this, this little point that's, that's outside the green line. You have these points over there. You have, you have these error bars that go all the way up there. But we still consider that model to be correct. So now you know why, even though we do not have absolute certainty that this is the true model, we have a very high probability that it is. Right. So now you know why we believe the Big Bang Theory is true. I also said you cannot have 100% precision. So what are the values of the parameters in our model? You know, when you, when you carried out your, your experiments over here, you were finding different values each time you measure the same thing. And the same thing happens whenever you carry out an experiment. You have some spread of values. Now, in, in a good experiment, you expect most of your values to lie around some central point. And that is, that is why when you, when you plot everything, you get, you get something of, of this sort. You have, you have probabilities. So in this case, you, you would expect 68% of your measurements to lie within that region. Now, even in the, in the most sophisticated experiments and in the best, best funded missions and everything, sometimes different experiments do not ag agree exactly. See, see this, this is all, those different lines are all different data sets, different experiments, measuring the same thing in a different way. They don't all agree. And that's why Chris could show the last slide with all those theories still there. And that's why, why, why we still study these theories, why, why we don't 
we, 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 we still take them seriously enough to include them. The, the parameter values themselves are not 100% sure either. You know, each time you, you have something, it's x plus minus x. But we have a probability, we have a confidence region. So we know that the next time, so this is the Hubble constant, for instance. See, if you, th this is the thing, um, if, if you ask someone what the Hubble constant is, they'll tell you it's about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And the key word there is not, it's, it's not the 70, it's not the kilometers per mega, megaparsec, it's, it's about. It's not exactly that number, it's, it, it's around, and, and each time we do an experiment, we will find a slightly different value. They're all around that number, but they're not all exactly the same. But at least we know that the next time we measure the Hubble constant, it will be within that rough region. So uh, how do we improve these measurements? If, if each time we, we have a different value, what can we do? There are some solutions, and, and you've seen them when you were carrying out your, your experiment. Some of you, you, you were trying to measure angles. Now it's very difficult to measure an angle just without using a, um, a guiding line. So, so some of you took one of the rulers and used it as a, as a, as a measuring guide. So we can make better instruments. Now you've been seeing these pictures, and I, I think I think they. they, they you, 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 you have a sensory overload of pictures, so we designed. That's the reason why we spend so much time, effort, and, and money on designing better experiments. So this is this is a picture of the cosmic microwave background. We started with that. This is 1992. This is late 90s. This is 2013. The instruments are getting better. But another way of doing it, and some of you did this as well, is to collect more data. So using the same, same instrument. And this is something that, um, that you've learned about. I think um, even, even Chiara mentioned it. This is a radio telescope. And, and the reason we need to use statistics in cosmology is that the the size of the data is just getting it, it it's enormous you can't use you can't draw a straight line on a on a piece of graph paper with a with a pencil it's important that's why we use computers this is a this is a radio telescope it it will be online i think in 2000 2017 2020 <laughs> okay they see even even on on the dates of experiments there's some uncertainty that's the that's perhaps the, the the worst of it but the data collected by by this radio telescope is equivalent to 15 million 64 gigabyte ipods per day now that's twice the entire internet traffic of the world per day so we need we need statistical methods. You, you can't you can't you, even if if you put all the scientists in the world at work doing things by hand, you couldn't do it. That's why we use computers. That's why we use statistics. And another way of improving our experimental precision is to combine data from different experiments. Aha! Uh -huh. Now this gets interesting. Because different experiments, even though they measure the same thing, have different characteristics. They're using different physical phenomena. So they do not all measure the same thing with equal precision. Some do better in certain areas, some do better in others. And uh, we had a question, um, I think on the first day, about how we measure the amount of, of dark energy in the universe. And this is how we did it. So th th these, are, these are three different experiments. That, that's the data. Those are the, the data points from, from three different experiments. So the cosmic microwave background, so th this is the amount of dark energy over there, and that's the amount of dark matter. The data points lie along this line. Mm. So the values of the two numbers could be anything. Baryon acoustic oscillations, which uh, 
I think Jim mentioned, do very well along this line. So they measure the the cold the, the, the cold dark what we call cold dark matter because it doesn't interact. So the dark matter content very well, but but not the dark energy content. So the the value of the dark energy could be anything along that line. But we know the amount of dark matter is something around 0 0.3, so that's 30% of, of the entire energy content, energy mass content of the universe. Supernovae do well, but the points are spread around this region, so they could be anything along this range of values. But when we put all three experiments together, there you go. We have constrained our value to a very small region over there. And that's how we do it. That's why we have people working on radio telescopes, people working on optical telescopes, BAOs, gravitational waves. We're all measuring the same thing. It's, it's one universe. But we're doing it in different ways. Different experiments, we combine those experiments to pinpoint the actual values more accurately. And this, once we have chosen our model, then it's just a question of knowing the values of the parameters. And the, the, some of the questions of parameter estimation today in, in cosmology are, are things like, like the value of the Hubble constant. So if, if you change that value, then some of your theory can change then you can start to think of alternative theories if you get some strange measurement. Or we can ask what is the amount of dark matter in the universe. And the answers we obtain, so this is how we go back from, from data to theory. Uh, the answers we, we obtain also depend on the model we choose. So under the simplest model we, we get some answer, if we go, if we add some parameters, we, we have some more complex model, we can get something different. Now, I said that um, once we have our six parameters, we're done and we can all go home. Well, not quite. So what happens if we don't just have one reasonable model, if there's more than one? then the question is not just to measure the values of the parameters, it's to choose between models. And I'm approaching the, the, the end of my presentation now, and this is the point where I wanted to mention the really deep questions in cosmology, the open questions. So, so the ones that, that, that even George Smoot doesn't know the answer to. Can I say that? <laughs> and these are questions that depend on model comparison or model selection. So things like, is the universe flat or not? Because the answer to that question may mean that we have to f invent or find new physics. Are the initial seeds of structure simple or was there some more complex mechanism? In the simplest model, we have the, the, the six-parameter model. Yes, they're simple, but, but the fit, to, we, the, because we don't have 100% precision, 100% certainty, it means there's still place for theories that tell us that there was some more complex mechanism. The third question, one of the most important ones, is dark energy constant, or does it change in time? Uh, we, we had an, another very good question about measuring not just the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, but the change in that acceleration. And that is linked to this question. And another question, which, which was in the news, we mentioned this on the first day, and I will end with this, is did the very early universe produce gravitational waves or not? Now, on... On the 17th March, or on the 16th March, 17th is when the, when the headlines were published, in March this year, there was a huge, huge news item. We said, we discovered proof of cosmic inflation. Inflation is the, um, the, the, the accelerated expansion in the very, very, very early universe. 
This, the, the media, there you go, Liz, truth. This was the media's truth, spectacular discovery. As far as the, the, the journalists were concerned, this was 100% certainty. We've discovered it, fine. Conferences, you know, websites, new, this, this is from, from the BBC website. Um, extraordinary new evidence, they said. And scientists, you know, boring people, most of them, especially the ones who work on statistics, <laughs> myself included, <laughs> they, because they know that we can never be 100% sure, they went back, checked their data, carried out more calculations, put in more data from, from other experiments, and on the day before this, com this uh, workshop, 23rd September, there was um, a result published which showed that that claim is not so rock solid after all. So, um, then the, the journalists got, got onto it and, uh, and they had to you know, go back on, on their original story and they said, yeah, maybe the, the scientists underestimated, but you know, as far as the journalists were concerned, it was the scientists who had made the mistake. So that's fine. Um, and in, in March, uh, this, 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 um, this is why, why probability is useful, because you can use it to place bets. So uh, there was a famous bet between um, Stephen Hawking, who uh, said that the early universe should produce gravitational waves, and uh, Neil Turok, who has a, a model of the universe, the one, one which is not that six-parameter model, uh, which says that it does not produce gravitational waves. So when, when the March result came out, Stephen Hawking said, ha, 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 I won the bet. In September, yeah, it wasn't so sure. So Neil, Neil Turok got in touch with Stephen Hawking again, and he said, um, well, this is, this is what he told the journalists. He didn't say, I won, you lost, or, or, or uh, I lost, you won. He, he said what, what a scientist should say. You know, Let's refine this bet. And in the end, it doesn't matter who wins. As long as we get closer, we, we will never have 100% certainty, but we'll get closer. So this is a lesson for life from cosmology and statistics. Now, when you carry out an experiment, never throw away your data. Even if it looks wonky or um, unexplainable, just keep it. Think about it. Analyze it. Don't throw it away. Learn from experience. You know, design better experiments. If an experiment doesn't give you the precision you're looking for, make some changes. Don't accept all theories. This is, a, this is really a lesson in, in life, not just in cosmology. You know, people will, will throw things at you. Politicians love statistics because you can, you can make people believe things that are not true. So question them. Then do, do your calculations and believe some of them. As long as you know your degree of belief. So you can place your bets, keep calm, place your bets, but place them sensibly. You know, Use the scientific method. And I think that that's what this workshop was, was meant to, to teach. Um, we've, we've discussed many things. And if we had 100% certainty, then there would be no point to, uh, to another workshop next year or to another conference. So we hope to still be doing this, to not have the ultimate truth. So uh, we'll still keep our jobs in the end. We won't be out on the streets. So that's it.